Welcome to No Budget, the show for filmmakers with no budget by filmmakers with no budget. Uh, I'm Milo Dennison, joined by Kahal Feeney and Claire Milan. And today we are talking with Tommy Cray, Killian McAvoy, and Jerry Cannon about their film, Acheron. Welcome to the show, guys. Hello. And welcome back, Tommy. Hello. I think we've, we've uh, had you on here before, actually. Yeah, I've been an interviewee and a, and a guest interviewer, so I've, mm -hmm. I've done all, everything in the in the no budget world. Yeah, yeah, and uh, Killian, obviously, I know we've worked together, and uh, you're on my other podcast. So I think Jerry is the only one I haven't met here out of everyone. Yeah, sure. welcome, Jerry. Welcome to Hello. no budget nice world. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Nice to meet you, Milo. You as well. Welcome to no budget world. So uh, uh, I like. Uh, Get, get the ball rolling here. So, Tommy, uh, your your film Acheron is that how you pronounce it? Acheron. Uh, Acheron. 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 Oh. No one knows, to be honest. Okay, right. Um, okay, so um, so tell tell us about the film then. Oh uh, well, it it it's it's a it's a story about a father and a son um, who are stuck at home together. Um. It kind of with the backdrop of the housing crisis and you know lots of people moving back in with their folks um and yeah it's just about the it's kind of like a domestic family drama that's shot kind of like a 1960s Antonioni film really so um and we yeah we just we just all worked together on it it was a passion project um we were all coming out of kind of it was when Ireland was coming out of its sort of first really strict lockdown and we were all just um chomping at the bit to, to go out and make something, these guys to act and me obviously to, to write something and, and direct. Mm -hmm. And the same with all the crew. Uh, and we just sort of, I wrote this script very quickly for, for both the actors, uh, Jerry and Killian. Um, and we, we just kind of, we workshopped it together and it was a very collaborative process. Um, and it's, I think it's, it's really quite a simple story, really. It looks quite, um, the look is, is quite um, distinct, but I think the story, the characters, it's quite, it's quite simple, really. It's just a, a family drama about frustration and, and intergenerational differences and um, things like that, quite universal themes. So the idea you had, was that, was that your own idea or was it part of, did it come out of the collaboration process? No, it was my idea. It was, it was my, you know, I wrote a first draft and, and then I kind of, gave it to the actors kind of prematurely, more prematurely than I would have normally because I kind of wanted them to put their own mark on it. And I like it when actors do that. And Killian and Jerry really kind of jumped at that and, uh, and re really took to that. So, um, but yeah, the idea, it was, it was something I wrote um, myself and it was, it was kind of slightly based off um, a Greek myth, the, the myth of Iphigenia who sacrificed for the family. And then afterwards the family kind of falls apart. Um, and um, that's a kind of theme that Christy, the main character who's a playwright, kind of toys with in, in his work and it's reflected in, in the film. Um, but yeah, it, it, was, it was something that I started with and then, and then these guys kind of, we, we all developed it together. It was, I mean, like any film, it was very collaborative. Um, I noticed with this film and, and some of your previous work that you do draw a lot from say, people like Joyce and, and Greek mythologies. Uh, can you maybe talk a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, well, I'm kind of obsessed with myth, really. Um, and I, yeah, I don't know. And it, it's something that I'm always drawn to. Um, I'm not really sure why, um, but it, it just, it always seems to, there always seems to be parallels you can, um, you can kind of draw in the modern world with these with these ancient stories and I always find that interesting and maybe it's like kind of shared humanity that we have that we can still relate to to these stories you know the story that we see now is like um you know it's like this 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 big greek tragedy played out on a really minuscule kind of scale um and you know those kind of family tensions that are in those kind of big Greek stories are still present in families, but they're much more kind of, they're much more withheld and they're much more inward. Um, so yeah, I think it was, it was that, that, that idea that I was interested in. And then also kind of like the idea in, in, um, 
the, the idea of the doomed house in, um, sorry, this is probably very obscure, but in, in the story of um, Agamemnon, that his whole family was kind of doomed and every generation kind of repeated the same mistakes of the, of the last. And I kind of thought that was interesting how we kind of, um, we kind of pass on our, our problems and we pass on our, our grievances. And I, I thought that was something that I thought is still very relevant um, today. So yeah, it, it just, I don't know, it just draw, I'm drawn to it. I don't, I'm not really. And why is it called, sure why, um, so why is it called Acheron? Is Acheron a character in a, in mythology or uh, why did you call it that? Is it? Um, it's a river. It's a the river that divides the living from the dead in, in Greek mythology. And the characters are kind of on this, the, 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 you know, they're, they're grieving in the film, not to give anything away. Um, and they're kind of, um, but they're not confronting it. And so they're kind of on this, in this kind of twilight um, liminal kind of space. Uh, and I thought that, that, that the name of that river, I like the sound of it. And um, the fact that they're exploring this, this estuary that kind of mirrors that as well. Um, Killian, did you have anything to say about that? The river. Did you? Because I remember you, you. We were talking about that. Did you? Did you have anything to say about that? Um. Well, I, I would be more versed in Irish folklore and mythology. Yeah. Uh, when you, I don't know much about Greek mythology. When you made the name suggestion, because it was something else. I can't remember what the working title was by now. Man, father versus son. Or no. Sorry, oh, oh, Orestes. Orestes. Yeah. Orestes, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I just I thought it was it made sense, um, as a sort of thing where and then it, as a little trigger, it would then send other people down the thing to figure out it's the river of the wall. And that's that's kind of what it is when you look it up. It comes up, it translates as the river of one, and if you see it in the stories, as Tommy says, that's what it actually is. So it just plays this sort of uh, extra character, and it really helped them play into. The visual of the painting which the film opened up with which gave Tommy that thing that anchor so like in terms of what it did for the story it did just give it an extra a uh, flavor so as it was going through the drafts it was also becoming more fleshy in terms of how deep into mythology we want to bring it and Tommy just kept playing that so I believe you uh you won an award uh did I think Jerry did you win an, an acting award is that right Amazing. Yeah, uh, the first one ever for me. Oh, well, congratulations. Oh, thank you, darlings. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, well, I was chuffed to be nominated. Um, that was at the Dublin International Short Film and Music Festival run by Florian Zapper. Um, and that was last October. So, um, yeah, when I was nominated, I thought this is really nice, you know, like, I mean, from an acting point of view, my first short film was only in 2016. So um, I haven't been at it years despite oh. my age. Um, so on the, on the day of it, um, it was on a Sunday when they had the awards ceremony. I'd gone to a couple of the screenings in Cineworld that they'd had on the Friday, Saturday. I said, I'm just going to go to the Sugar Club anyway, where they have the Sunday screenings and, you know, to support them. Because I knew talking to Florian in Cineworld, um, could have been on the Saturday that um, because of the whole COVID thing, I had been the last time he had had the festival there was, I think, in 2019 and was actually at that. And he said, like, they didn't even have 50 percent of the audience, you know, walking in the door that they had in 2019. And, you know, I said, OK, I'll just go to the, the awards thing anyway, because from an actress point of view, I mean, there was guys like Fia Kuntz and Barry John Kinsler were also nominated, who are, you know, superb actors. And um, so I was just sitting there chatting to the proverbial Aidan O'Sullivan, who goes to everything <laughs> and is in everything. And um, I think Richie Kane was there with us as well. And suddenly the awards goes up and there's a clip from Acheron. And I said, oh, Jesus, me. So there you go. Went up, accepted the award on behalf of the whole cast and crew. Um, yeah, so that was really nice. Um, chuffed. 
And it, it was kind of good because I also felt that, you know, I've had, you know, done I've a few performances and a few other short films I done I had done previously, which I thought were good. But generally speaking, you know yourself, you do a short film, even if you're one of the main characters, you know, if it's a five minute short or even a 10 minute, I mean, you might possibly be only maximum in two or three minutes of it. And if you boil that down, it's very hard to, you know, give a, a performance where there is a bit of an arc. You know, you're just a bit of a character for one particular moment in time and you do your best. But um, getting back to the, you know, the process without uh, preempting any other questions, but the starting off point here, what well, really was a unique opportunity when uh, Tommy contacted me. Um, and bearing in mind, the first time I met Tommy and Claire was at the Fast and Film Festival. We all ended up on a table as a quiz. Well, I'd met yeah. them during the week. I mean, I know nothing about films, actually, but um, even those involved in filmmaking and acting, um, joined them at the same table. And then just on the back of that, if nothing else, um, Tommy contacts me and said, you know, I have this script and I have this idea that I'd like to work with two actors and develop it. And I thought that was wonderful because normally in filmmaking, you turn up on the day, you might never have met the person you're playing opposite. Um, by the time you do, you know, take number three, four, five, whatever it is, you're kind of just getting warmed up. Then you're moving on to the next scene and then you're at the next scene and you think in the back of your head, I should have actually thought about playing the thing between the two of us slightly differently in the previous scene, and you've already moved on. So the moment has been lost. So the the absolute joy of being able to, not even the development thing, but just being able to rehearse. And I mean, I knew from my own filmmaking thing, I'm jumping ahead here, just getting to the broad meadow estuary of Malahide Swords is that, you know, I said, from what I've seen, you know, sometimes with, you know, no budget filmmaking crews, um, you know, there's a lot of setting up that goes on with the first or second shot. It could be, doesn't matter if it's the start of the film or they do the end bit first. And suddenly there's a chunk of time gone, which you can't get back. And we had about, I think, if I'm right, Tommy, maybe four different scenes that were along that whole estuary so i said let's go out there and effectively block it out in advance so we know the setup when it was great connor was there who had met previously so when we arrived out in the day and we were blessed because of that glorious sunny day we had we didn't run out of daylight because it was about seven o'clock i think in the evening we were sitting on the beach at the end doing that last scene where there's the bit of reconciliation between the father and the son um but if we had got delayed and we didn't have a sunny day, it would have been a case of we've had to come back another day, despite the preparation. But it literally just fell into place because of that. And so, have, you uh, ever, have you ever worked with Killian before? Or is that the first time? No, that was the first time I met Killian, uh, which was great because um, when we got to that initial process of developing the script, I mean, Killian has great attention to detail. He studied film inside out to front so most of those development meetings I was going oh yeah okay what do you think Tommy yeah what do you think Killian mm, yeah grand and um, we moved on you know a few weeks later new script to come out two weeks later maybe um what it was I suppose essentially is that like all good things um the, the script just kept getting pared down and pared down and you know if I remember one case to a Killian I mean there was a kind of you know at what point did we reveal the situation about without giving anything away that there was a sibling that you know Killian's character Christie had, and basically what happened in that scenario really has a big impact on the relationship between the father and the son. So you know we didn't want to reveal that too soon. Um, so there was, there was lots of bits and pieces like that which were valuable, and ultimately you know you can see it in the in the work itself, because you, you can watch a lot of short films and you, you know, you look and you enjoy it and say, and after say, would it be great if they did this or wouldn't it be good if they had, if it was written this way. But I think one of the nice things about Akram is that um, when you see the package, you kind of think there's nothing really wrong with that. 
you know. <laughs> um, it, it just seems to be a complete thing, you know. It, it's not sort of lacking something because at, at the best times, I suppose, a lot of short films are just experiments, really, for what might be potentially a great feature film. But I think from beginning to end, it, it just works really nicely. And certainly the work that was done between Tommy's writing, rewrites with the input, mainly from Kitchen, the odd line or two from me, um, and us blocking the thing out and rehearsing it, it just, you know, um, it worked. And I suppose that's why in the few short film, or the few film festivals that it has been in, you know, it has been very well received. And I'm sure there's still a bit of mileage in it yet. So Killian, how how did you find working with these guys? The truth. Yeah, really good. Um, Everton was very professional. Um, I think Tommy came to see the new music with Connor. Um, I hadn't properly met Tommy before, so it was kind of it was kind of nice. It kind of all started with a bit of uh, of respect and appreciation. Um, would you like to have a look at the script that I think you'd uh, you, you'd be good for the main character, which was quite nice, obviously. So there was no auditions, but a sense of respect was uh, was rooted from the very beginning. Um, so that that's always a very good footing for, for me, from my point of view, to do what it is that I like to do uh, as an actor to express myself. You're given that that branch of I trust you to do this job, and then as Jerry had been talking so well about everything. Um, that sense to be able to dive into a script and as Tommy also said it was given to us as he says too early but it, it was fine because it just meant we, were, we all had something to look forward to during a very very difficult time for all of us creativity was uh, not e excellent because uh, everything was locked down but cut Tommy I guess in some uh, as film tends to do give it a sort of sense of opportunity for uh, a, a sense of magic and so we were all able to come together the three of us through a means like this through zoom and we had conversations about the script then that's kind of how i met jerry first was through zoom uh, i'd seen jerry before when i was uh, in, in a film in the dressmaker so that was my only first introduction until i saw him then uh, on zoom and then we met in tommy's flat um that he had at the, at the time uh, out in Clontarf and we were able to all meet together and sit there together and talk together and move around in the kitchen together and work through the lines so it was very um, um, uh, I don't know hey hey it's it was, it was, it was all, it was a good experience but that 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 sense of just camaraderie and almost just letting our, ourselves trust each other uh, I think that's what this uh, opportunity was, was really a case for building trust and a relationship. And then when we got there to film it, it was, uh, yeah, it was great because we didn't have to hold back. And as you'll see in the, the story, my character doesn't have to hold back. Uh, he likes to uh, to express himself, especially uh, through, through, through language. Um, so it was very, very good. And I felt very uh, supported by both Tommy and Jerry. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know if that's quite getting to what it exactly is the question, but I felt supported and it was a great uh, experience to be with both of them. And it's very exciting that the film is uh, being received by an audience because it's not usual to see Irish films coming like this, but these are the types of films that I wanted to be able to make because they're the type of movies like Tommy mentioned, Antonioni. I'm a huge uh, fan of Italian and French cinema. So it's nice to be someone in Ireland that's a part of that type of filmmaking. So, and it's actually it's filmed in a beautiful. I love black and white films, and I recently went to see uh, Belfast, and now it's filmed in black and white. And and I just, there's something magical about them. But why did you choose black and white? Was there like specific reason, or what was what was the reason behind it? It was, yeah, it was actually a practical reasons because the script um, had a very particular atmosphere that was it was it talked of like a gloomy. Dublin summer's day and um, thought, yeah, that's money in the bank. We're gonna, that, no problem. Wasn't worrying about that at all. 
and and when we ended up shooting it in late September, it was actually I think one of the hottest days of the year. Just like broad sunshine, not a cloud in the sky. Um, and uh, it was actually Camilla who was taking some photographs. Who she was taking some photographs in color and taking some photographs in black and white. She was just showing me the photos and sort of saying, "I think it's I think it's black and white." I'm sort of dismissive, but yeah, it just when when we got to the edit, it was just a way to kind of get back to that atmosphere. Um, that, that was the gloomy kind of atmosphere in the script that that was that that suited it better. Um, and then when I, I yeah, I, I, I think Steve, the editor, who did a fantastic job as well, he showed me the film. The first time he showed it to me, he showed it to me in black and white. And ever since I saw it in black and white, I just didn't want to see it in colour. I didn't even want to see it because it just, it just suited it so well. And I think maybe it's uh, like you said, that kind of magical, it creates this kind of otherworldly, um, kind of maybe limbo-y kind of, um, kind of atmosphere, this, this, this kind of different kind of light. That, that Definitely, and it brings a very um, nostalgic feel to the film. And you wouldn't realize it was shot like in sunshine. You know, it didn't look like that at all on screen. Yeah. And you actually live in Spain at the moment. And uh, how much prep did you do? And especially considering you live in Spain, did you travel back to Ireland, or how did that work? Well, no, we shot this near, like in two thousand and twenty. So um, I was living, yeah, I was living in Ireland at the time. Um, so yeah, and it was it was kind of during lockdown. So we all had a lot of free time on our hands or kind of coming out of lockdown. Um, so yeah, we it was actually Connor, the cinematographer, who he lives in Swords, um, and he kind of had the idea to shoot it there. Um, and we all kind of went to the location to rehearse as well. So it was quite immersive um, preparation. It, these guys actually wanted to do that. I didn't think, I thought I wouldn't, you know, I won't put them through that, bring them all, all the way out to Swords. But they they actually said, no, let's let's go out to Swords. So, yeah, we, we, we were lucky enough to, to have that. And the Killian's right, the location really is a character in the story um, that, that kind of, I think, brings that, that element to it. You, uh, speaking of, you mentioned Connor, and uh, I'm curious, how do you source your cast and crew? It seems like you draw from your network pretty regularly um is that just you find good people that you like working with uh kind of talk about how you kind of create that network yeah well it's, it's people i've worked with over the years who i i trust and um it is like because i'm not i can't do everything i'm not a technician in any way shape or form so there are other people around me who you know like um Connor, who is, you know, knows more about visuals. Steve, who is the editor, and also the um, Matt Flanagan, who did the sound design, was really important. And um, every one of them was like a kind of artist on the film. We were talking about cast and crew. Uh, how long did it take to make? Actually, was it shot over um, a few days, or it was quite, quite quick. Yeah. So, so the, do you mean the whole process, or? Just, yeah, well, um, yeah, just, just more the filming and editing. I know writing can vary and that kind of stuff, but yeah, more the 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 production yeah. itself. It was yeah, it was pretty quick, as I said, just because we kind of had that window. So I mm -hmm. wrote it, as I said, I wrote it quite quickly um, and sent it to these guys quite quickly, and I we shot it in two days. Um, we had one day indoors and then we had all the outdoor stuff in in one day as well which was kind of insane but actually really good because we just kind of had to had to bring it um and um and yeah and, and it's probably the whole and then we edited it maybe for um quite a long time like the edit was probably the longest part of maybe about five months or something like that um yeah it's funny you with kind edits. of can take you can yeah, you can take your time with pre-production and post-production, I find, but with short films, like if you're not, you know, you don't have those constraints, but yeah, we, we very, we're very kind of rush shooting it. Mm. Along those lines then, any advice to our no budget filmmaking audience on how to shoot efficiently and well in a very short period of time? Yeah, probably just trust who you're working with. Um, you know, uh, make sure that you have the best team around you. Um, very good actors like these guys as well, who are very professional. Uh, means you're not always doing um, retakes and retakes. We got everything pretty quickly, actually. 
Um, that final scene, which is the best scene in the film by quite a long way, I think you guys did maybe one or two takes. It was kind of insane. Maybe Jerry did one take um, and it was just <laughs> bang on. So <laughs> working with pros like this it is really helpful and actually very cost effective. And um, yeah, just have, have a very strong team of who you trust and who you're not going to have to kind of dictate everything to because they just kind of get it. And you've done a lot of that work beforehand, you know, in, in pre-production. Definitely making use of pre-production as well, because that is when, you know, when you don't have those kind of restraints on you. So you can do a lot of stuff in pre-production so that you're not having to waste time kind of on set working it out. So uh, what is the status of the film at the moment? Is it, where can people see it, for instance? Uh, so it's going to be in Chicago in, uh, in March. So I think that's going to have an online program. I'm not sure if it's going to be free or not. Um, but yeah, Chicago, um, which should be great. I think it looks like a great lineup. Um, it, yeah, we're still waiting to hear back on, on a fair few festivals. So hopefully be hearing some more of it. And then eventually maybe um, in a few months, we'll be releasing it online as well. That's the Chicago Irish Film Festival, isn't it? Yes, the Chicago Irish Film Festival, yeah. And... Uh... I take it it'll be in the uh, the James Joyce Film Festival as well. Well, you see, I'm not sure because that's my festival, so I'm not mm. sure if I can select my own film. I'm a little <laughs> bit. I'm not sure about maybe, that. Maybe so. I'm not sure how I feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, where where was it shot actually? Where was that uh, location? It was shot on the the Swords Estuary, um, just kind of opposite Malahide on the other side of the river. Um, it's a lovely little neighborhood, um, like, you know, harbors and, and uh, I think it's quite a few famous people live there. Doesn't, didn't we find out Stephen Ray lived there and Brendan Gleeson or something like that? No. Um, okay. Yeah. So it's pretty, pretty epic place. And that little sandbar is just, uh, we had to wade out there. We, these guys, this is, this, is a, this is a good demonstration of the dedication of this crew. They all waded through about two foot of water to get to that final scene ah, okay. um, the whole crew actors um yeah and it was like we would planned like every time we went there it was slightly different the tides and there was this kind of very narrow um road that led up to the beach and the first time we went there it was fine we walked across it the second time there was like you know we were kind of in that much water and then the last time when we were actually shooting it it was like and we thought we weren't going to get across oh but everyone was just like let's do it Let's get in the water. In, so. in, in, including Killian? Because that seems out of character for him. I would imagine he'd want like his own little boat to ferry him across or at least somebody to carry him. Yeah, yeah. yeah Tommy took me like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come on, you busts. That's what he said. Come close. It was, it, yeah, it was pretty dramatic. It was like, like the end of the Lord of the Rings. Was, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised Tommy back is healed by now you know you're not afraid you get stranded out there because you know the way the water can come in and in it can be quite dangerous you weren't afraid of that at all I didn't think that yeah, we got some bloody bloody, <laughs> bloody lovely, lovely, some bloody lovely, lovely shots <laughs> uh so uh, anything you want to say to tommy now the film is over and wrapped and out in the festivals <laughs> <It's> all, <laughs> all good and bad to me. Okay, hey, Jerry first. Come on. <laughs> oh, Greek to me. That's it. Um, well, I, I would say um, what what's great about Tommy is that um, well, aside he, he's expanded my knowledge of Greek mythology, which I knew very little of. But um, yeah, I, I think there's a certain um, passion that he has for storytelling, and you know, he has a particular vision, and you know, it was a pleasure for him for me to be invited by him. It was uh, a pleasure for him to work with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to tell us You're right, really Jerry. You're right, Jerry. You're right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll probably say that back to front, but no. Um, it's true. No, absolutely. Um, I, you know, the, the key to anything, actually, you know, you know yourself, any kind of a film. If the script is good, that's the starting off point. You know, we, we've seen, you know, $100 million budget movies 
big mega star actors. In fact, great actors. Forget about the mega star thing. And the script was shite. So it was doomed to failure, but someone tried to make a commercial success out of it. Um, you know, so I think that the, the key to anything uh, film wise is the script. And, you know, that was um, Tommy's knowledge, expertise, his passion for storytelling, using drawn and mythology and everything. Um, you know, and, and the black and white thing, actually, I mean, I was a bit disappointed initially because, you know, from what I'd seen on the day, the fact that, you know, we had this, it was effectively a summer's day on the 20th or 21st of September. Um, one of the behind the scenes photos, you know, we were there under the bridge, which is like the M1 coming into Dublin over uh, the estuary. Um, there's this lovely, um, you know, shot blue sky and there's, you know, greens and yellows in the landscape. And I said, this is going to look great. And then I saw black and white and I kind of, oh, Jesus, what are they at like? Um, but in terms of the tone and the mood, it all made perfect sense again. So from an artistic point of view, which I had no input into whatsoever, it all, it, it really, uh, I think, jumping slightly sideways here, I think it's just the um, artistic input from Tommy, et cetera, um, in that particular vein, you know, just added to the thing. Whereas, you know, an average film actor, oh gosh, we have brilliant lighting here. This is great. You know, this is, you know, you know, from a, a landscape and cinematography point of view, if you were just taken in the actual location, which is lovely where we were, you could have just, you know, put the focus nearly on that rather than the story. And I think as Tommy did, uh, in terms of the mood and the tension, etc., and as Claire, you know, saw from watching it, it's it, the black and white just worked well. And spending that time again, a bit like in the script development, but at the at the far end of it, there was one or two. I think there was one scene that was chopped out actually that we did. Uh, the ending was also changed slightly because in the original ending that we shot, you know, myself and uh, Christy character. Killian are at the beach. We go back to the house. We go back in to where we started off earlier that morning. You know, please, Christy, will you come for a walk? It's bank holiday. And I sort of look up the stairs as he's walking up to start working on his script. And I say something like, Christy. And he goes, Yeah. I said, Well, I get us a takeaway. And then he smiles, says, Yeah. So that's kind of resolved. But that that didn't end up in it. But the ending where it's based the voiceover of Killian as the Christie character back finishing off as it started with him narrating, you know, his next piece of work, having had the success with his initial play before we began. I must, I must mention all the other people who contributed to all those bold decisions. Um, yeah, Connor Tobin, who, who shot it and gave it that real distinct, intentional look, everything in it. I think um nothing looks kind of random everything is kind of blocked out I think he, he did a fantastic job there and then um Steve McKenna uh the who, I, who edited the film again pushed me to be he's a very bold filmmaker and uh he's a director himself and he, he really pushed those ideas and and uh and allowed me to to be bold with decisions like cutting out the final scene and having the characters kind of disappear so yeah and and then also as I said um Matt Flanagan in the um, sound design department and Matt Lester, who, who color graded it as well. It was everyone who worked in that process, we all kind of encouraged me as opposed to said, well, maybe we should leave it in color because, look, you know, so it was um, it was it was great to, to work with those guys. Um, and, and I felt very, very lucky and supported to to be able to make it, you know, something maybe a little bit different. I think watching it, you can tell it was a very kind of supportive environment. So I noticed when I watched some films I watched, especially short films, you can you can sometimes you can see that they were under a lot of stress or people fell out or something behind the scenes when you watch it. But with this, I, I really got a sense of you're all together in this and and you know you you were you knew what you were doing. And Killian, any last word now for Tommy? Any last thing you want to add to that? This is your, this is your chance, Killian. <laughs> I, I, I'm, 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 I'm sorry that that you're dying, Tommy. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. 
<laughs> Which last words are we talking about here? Um, last no, words, yeah, Killian. Last words, last words. It's, 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 yeah. No, um, it, it's funny. Um, no, I, I don't. I don't have any last words uh, because I, I hope that um, me and Tommy can keep uh, as collaboration in, in, into the future, so we can keep uh, words and ideas uh, and, and share together a, a, a cinematic uh, uh, vision that that will challenge what is out there at the moment and celebrate the things that have come to pass, which was kind of, I guess, in a, in a way, a nutshell of, of how me and Tommy felt uh, collaborating. It was great to be able to mention my favourite filmmakers and Tommy would share uh, the filmmakers. I mentioned musicians. Uh, Daniel Johnston had passed away around the time we were going through the through the, the start of everything and he was a very sensitive soul and poet of a, of a, of a musician. And I, I, I shared this with Tommy. He was very open to uh, to listen to me rambling uh, about things I was feeling as a, as a person, as an artist. Uh, and uh, it was good to be able to then incorporate that back then into the story, into the character and into the friendship and uh, uh, sort of thing that we were able to come together with. And was this made, uh, when was this exactly made during lockdown? Was it in the early stages of lockdown or was it... Um, when was it made? Like, how did you cope with dealing with COVID and making this film? Yeah, it, it was shot in September after in 2020. So um, as the kind of summer easing of restrictions was starting to become tighter again, we actually made it on the eve before. I think if we'd have made it a day later, we wouldn't have been able to do it because Jerry wouldn't have been able to travel from Greystones. Um, to, to come to come on the shoot so it was very tight and yeah as, he, as Killian said we did a lot of rehearsals over zoom um obviously wasn't ideal um but yeah we, we you know that, that and partly that's why it was good to actually be able to go out there because you know it was outdoors so it was it was much safer so yeah we, there were a lot of um challenges but I think yeah it was such a small crew and such a kind of uh small project in many ways that that we kind of helped ourselves out a bit there um yeah um guys have anything uh that you're working on now that any you want to mention not necessarily together just in general anything worth bringing up that we want to keep an eye out for well, I, I may say something that uh Killian's actually in um my production company uh, oh, films. that's why he spoke nicely about you because you guys are still working in a film. <laughs> it makes sense. Uh, <laughs> now we me, get but, it. But, yeah, we get it. Connor's film, mm. yeah, Connor's film, Master Slave, which is coming out soon, and that looks very interesting. And Killian is absolutely fantastic in that as well. So uh, that's something to look forward to. Um, I'm, you know, I'm developing a new short film. Nothing really, um, you know, nothing in majorly in pro uh, production at the moment. What about you guys? Yep. Last time. <laughs> um, well, in my case, well, I'm doing a short film on the 8th of March down in Tullamore. Uh, it's an interesting project. Um, it's about it's set in 1825. Um, it's about how young Jewish boys were conscripted into the, the Russian Tsar's army at the time and forced to convert to Christianity. Um, I literally got, I auditioned for the role of a priest. It just came by default. An actor, Paul Murphy, had got the part. He subsequently also got cast in a play in London. So he recommended me to the producer. They said, can you self-tape? I self-taped for the part of the priest. And they got back um, Tuesday this week and said, um, actually, you'd be very suited as the rabbi <laughs> in the opening scene. So... So I'm heading down to Tullamore. And what's interesting about that, just as by the way, from an actress point of view, they do have, they, they sent over a contract, which is an equity as an equity UK contract. And the contract is for short films and um, festival films. Now, the rate of pay isn't huge, but there's a lot of stuff here that we could learn from in Ireland. And it's pity equity in Ireland don't have the same clout, even though I'm a paid up member of equity in Ireland, Irish equity. Um, but for instance, like one of the things is if you, whatever work you do up to a particular Saturday, you have to be paid for 
by the following Friday and so on. And there's also clauses in there which protect the producer as well. But um, certainly um, we could do it a bit more of that here. Um, so following on from that, um, March, I'm involved in a feature film called Dublin Crust, which is Baz Black's film. It's about a punk band who reunite many years later. It's kind of a bit of a commitments meet sort of train spotting thing. I'm also producer on that. Um, so uh, that'll be full steam ahead from about the 10th of March to the 28th. And I have three days on set with that. So that's that's the only thing that I know about that's going to happen for definite. Other than that, it's who knows what's around the corner. Oh, sounds busy. Uh, last question for all three of you. Uh, any lessons that you learned from the experience of working on this film or anything that you'd do differently? Uh, advice for our no budget audience? Tommy, you're muted. I'm like an old man with this. I just, yeah. <laughs> uh, That's my oh, job. Just technology, you kids. You yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got no excuse. Um, mm-hmm. But, but yeah, one of the things I would say with with this film is is uh, kind of look at what you have there in front of you, um, and uh, we we kind of reverse engineered this film quite a lot. Um, because I knew I wanted to work with these two actors. You know, I wanted to, I, I, I like to write parts for people because I find it's a lot easier than writing this abstract person and then trying to cast it. Um, and so, so, and we, so we actually kind of found the location and had the actors in mind before we actually wrote it. Um, and I know that that might seem kind of like putting the cart before the horse, but um, as long as you go back to the horse and make sure the horse is there, you know. Um, so I would say don't be afraid to, to reverse engineer it because that, then you can find yourself, you know, in, in the position where you've got your script and everything's there and ready to go. And you know what you have and you know what you don't have. Um, and I, sometimes actually that can lead to more interesting stories as well because you've come at it from a different angle. Um, you know, and you haven't just started with, you know, the, your usual kind of where's the story, where's the idea, what's the concept. So um, I would say, yeah, with indie filmmaking, uh, see, see what you've got, see who you know, and, and try and make something around that if you can. And then, yeah, I'd say I learned, I actually, talking about the sending the script up too early, I, I agree with Killian, I actually quite like that as well, that and having that collaborative process on the script um and where everyone's kind of got their fingerprints on it um so i think yeah i think i'd do that again as well actually nice. killian jerry anything you guys want to add go ahead killian go ahead uh, <laughs> in terms of i don't know um i, I if it feels like acheron is kind <laughs> of yeah uh, if like it takes time to to get there so if people see it and like I know Tommy and Connor worked on a couple of uh, kind of very tough story sort of character based things before together. Like Akron is kind of a, uh, you know, it takes time to get there. You have to develop the craft, but the only way you're going to try and develop that craft is by doing. Uh, and as Tommy said, trusting the people that you're around so that you're able to express yourself in, in a way that is very truthful, which is the, the key of proper cinema if that's what you're trying to get at um, the ten- depending on what type of films you're trying to make as we did with this particular film so I'll talk from that point of view that to get a cinematic uh, film it, it, it needs to be touching truth and reality and there, there is a lot to be said for trusting the people around you and allowing for collaboration uh, and it mightn't seem like it's going to pay off but if you don't trust the people that you're around uh, there's going to be doubt and Claire mentioned earlier on you can tell when people aren't all together and in unison uh, but even uh, after reading uh, Tarkovsky's uh, book uh, sculpture and sculpting in time um, he even says like it's so important that everybody is essentially singing from the same hymn sheet so if you're not all singing from the same hymn sheet it means that something is going to be uh, amiss and the only way you're going to do that is by letting all your uh, you know, walls fall down around people and it might be scary, but in order to great, create great art, you need to be uh, willing to make sacrifices. 
Uh, so don't be afraid to make sacrifices uh, in order for something beautiful to happen. That's kind of, uh, I guess, for this type of film, that's the best lesson to give. Cool. Yeah, right. um, just to add in there, um, and in, in the context of, you know, people who make no budget films, um, naturally, there will be a certain number of people involved who are on a learning curve or just starting out as well as people who are experienced. Um, but certainly from an actor's point of view, and I originally trained as a theatre actor back in the 1980s and didn't give up the day job before I came back to this. So um, what, I, what I found about filmmaking is that a lot of the time it's about the technical process. So sometimes there's, you know, too much obsession with the cinematography and, you know, the setups on the day and a good script, you know, the, the story can just get lost. And, you know, the proof of the pudding here is that the fact that we actually had rehearsals, which were quite unusual in filmmaking and developing that. I mean, it doesn't really matter if you, if you, if you have a short film, this is just in general, I'm just talking to people. If you have a short film, you say, okay, we're going to do this the weekend after next. Well, actually, if you spend the time working on the story with the actors and do it in four weeks after that, what you will end up with will be far better. Technically, it will still look the same, but something that's technically good, but looks like there's bad acting because there's either a lack of direction or you know, it just, the, the storyline just wasn't explored enough. And that's where an awful lot of short films fall down. It's not about, you know, and the, the thing that irks me, and I'm giving you the actor's view here, is that you see a post up, it could be in Film Network Ireland. It's on a Thursday. Want somebody Saturday to turn up to be in a park for something. You know, they're not fecking props with legs or robots. If you really want a proper acting performance from an actor, especially one who knows what they're at, you know, that's not the way to approach it. That's an absolute disastrous way, from my point of view, to set up a project. You might as well just go out and film landscapes or a boat sailing around a harbour somewhere, you know. But if you're going to involve actors, put the work into that bit as well, because it'll pay off big time at the other end. You know, it's a bit like if you made a film and never color graded. You know, it's the same thing with actors. So that would be my little nugget to pretend. Uh, yeah, very good advice. I think a lot of things coming out of Hollywood could use that advice as well. I would say as well on, on Jerry's note there that my personal kind of opinion is that casting is, is as important as the script mm. in that if you don't get the actors right and if you don't get the performances right, then then it's it's not going to be a good film in the same way that with the script. So it's, it's something that you need to spend a lot of time, time on and making sure you get it right. Um, so, yeah. And it's always very important for, for me. And it was, it was very important with this, these two guys, you know, were, were, were hugely important. As, you know. All right. Well, I think I speak for Colin Claire when I say thank you for giving us the opportunity to watch the film. We enjoyed it. And uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you. And um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very thank much. You, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Claire. <laughs>